I've been a developer for about 10 years before I actually shifted to the DevOps, which I, it, uh, so, so last two years I've been contributing towards the chef development. So I have contributed to uh, some knife plugins. Uh, there is a Chef Azure extension which I have developed. Uh, the Knife plugins include Knife Azure, Knife EC2, Knife OpenStack. I've also uh, been involved in the de uh, development of Knife WinRM. Then uh, there's this Knife Windows Listener, which is probably will go, uh, which will be rolled out in probably Windows Knife Windows 1.0. So, but currently I'm working with iHealth Technologies. Um, at iHealth Technologies, we are actually building a new product. So we have a legacy product, uh, which has been around for about like 15 to 20 years. And making any changes to that, it's like, it's better we stay away from it. So we're actually building a new product, which would compete against our legacy product. And this new product is pretty exciting. It has an exciting technology stack. So uh, we are using Scala. We're using the ACA framework. And uh, we're using the triple store. So it's actually a graph database. And as exciting as the technology stack, we've actually started you know, uh, uh, developing a DevOps policy or the DevOps strategy right from the uh, beginning. So we are actually uh, trying to you know, build a very good uh, product, which has, you know, we've got DevOps at the right time, and we are trying to build something cool for uh, our product. So and my current role, actually, it actually falls in aligns with my passion for technology, innovation, and the thirst to keep learning. So in my project, I do get to do all of this. And it's really a good project. And in fact, I'd like to let you know if you all are interested, you can send me your resume. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so I love to travel, read, write. And I've got two boys back at home. And yeah, I've, I'm from India. And I've flown about like 20 hours to come to this conference. And I'm all happy about it. <laughs> Yeah, so we'll quickly go through uh, a quick introduction to Docker. Uh, then why Docker and Chef, you know, can be friends. There is a line of thought where they say, oh, if you're using Docker, then you don't have to use Chef. So probably that's something, I mean, uh, my experience showed that we actually, Docker and uh, Chef can be used together. It's a good idea. So I'll, we'll, I'll just go through a small, uh, simple CD pipeline uh, in which we've used Knife SSH. Uh, we explored a little bit of push jobs, too. Uh, then we gradually also uh, used Chef Cookbook. Uh, then we had a sneak peek into Chef containers. And we'll conclude with uh, some of the lessons that we learned uh, in this Docker and containerization, whatever we've been doing. So uh, before I go, uh, how many of you have actually used Docker or tried stuff? So there are quite a few. Yeah, so this is a quick introduction to Docker. Uh, so Docker is actually a Linux container. So it's like a lightweight virtualization provided by libraries inside the Linux kernel. It has three components. So Docker engine, which is like a lightweight runtime. Uh, it's a packaging tool. It's portable. So Docker Hub is actually a hosted uh, application where you can save your Docker images. It helps you in automating your workflows. And the Docker images, which are like a layered uh, file system, probably. Um, OK, it's open source. And uh, it's actually fast, portable. Docker is portable. And density, by density, I mean uh, on a machine, uh, uh, you can run more number of Docker containers as opposed to the number of virtual machines that you can run. And yeah, they say that Docker can create, OK, with Docker, you can create lightweight, self-sufficient containers from any application. So Docker is actually different from a virtual machine. So as you see, in a virtual machine, uh, you have a guest operating system, which takes about tens of GBs of data. Whereas in Docker, it's just your application and the dependencies uh, that it's running, So, act which makes it, so every Docker container runs in its own isolated user space. And so it's, act yeah, so we, Docker actually benefits from getting its um, uh, the isolation and allocation benefits, but it's also because of, you know, it saves, you don't have the entire um, guest OS and a lot of other dependencies, so it, it becomes lightweight and portable. 
Right, and it's, uh, yes, and Docker containers actually share the same kernel space. So this is actually um, how the Docker file looks like. So Docker files are actually something with which you codify your configuration. It's a set of bash commands. So this is a very simple uh, example where you take an Ubuntu image, uh, you do some kind of uh, what, uh, executions to write something, so here as an example, consider there is an, a repository called HalloScala. So you'll write a Docker file, which will have whatever you need for that. Probably you'll have some configurations. And one way is like you just add that configuration to your Docker image by probably just, it's a add command is like a copy into it. And then you run the command called as Docker build HalloScala probably, and it'll generate a Docker image for you. So Docker uh, finds its applications in primarily shared hosting uh, or pass applications. So many internet ser search providers or even some, a lot of hosted applications, even Travis CI, they all use Docker. Uh, so it actually helps them. Uh, it's, it's actually used for infrastructure virtualization and application isolation. So places where they want um, actually to get that isolation as well as it becomes faster. So microservices, it's like an architecture where you have broken down your application into small services which run independently, but they depend on each other. So in such scenarios, you can have Docker, where Docker is running a particular small one of the service, and then each are actually are talking to each other, these services. So it's actually used in microservices. And also for lightweight testing. Uh, since you can bring up a Docker pretty fast, so you can bring up Docker, you can run your tests, and then just destroy that container. When you want to run again, you just bring up another container, you run it, and then you can just. Docker is also being considered in production uh, many, uh, at many companies. In fact, yesterday there was a good pre presentation from Dharma Fever about how long they've been using Docker. For us, we, our product is right now not into production. So we are still in the development stages. So, um, but we are trying to containerize our application and try to see how, how much of a benefit it would be to get it into production. So I'll be talking about it in this session, about our experiences. So, so it's actually the challenge is that we want to actually automate everything. So we want to actually, wherever, like minimize all the manual steps, wherever you can automate, you want to automate, you want to get, you know, everything into your system. So it's all the needs as he said in the morning, so something that you would need and you would need in the future, you want to actually bring it all into your system, and yet you want to deliver it on time. So, uh, and it's again at the cost of speed and quality as uh, yesterday Barry mentioned in his keynote. So we want to uh, be, you know, we want to deliver it fast, but we still don't want to compromise on the quality. So this is a challenge that we all have. And uh, Chef is actually addressing Lord, so Chef is here to address this challenge. Docker is also here to address this challenge. So it's actually you can combine the benefits of both and you know, bring out some awesome results. So people have been comparing Chef and Docker and also it's comparing Chef and Docker is like comparing configuration management versus golden images. So uh, configuration management with that, you can control your environment. Whereas the golden image, the Docker, it actually belongs to the school of golden images. So where you have a system image where, or a runtime image, you create a, a system image and the, like it's, it's something you can create and you can keep running it. So if, if you want to make any changes to it, you have to go back, build a new image. So that, those are those Docker images. Both come at a, a trade-off between flexibility and manageability. So with configuration management, you get that flexibility. You, and with Docker or the golden images is something that makes it, makes you, uh, it makes your life easier. Like you just have something and then you can keep running it. So it becomes easy to manage it. So you don't have, so it's, it's actually what you want to choose. Uh, with this, it's like configuration management has been like a vein of DevOps. So right, right from, long time back when you have huge shell scripts or bash scripts doing a job for you, which we have, it's gradually progressed into a no, 
more mature solutions like CM tools like Chef, we've been trying to get that flexibility into your system. But, but with Docker's around the container era in generally, we are going back into something called as immutable uh, infrastructure. So in, immutable infrastructure is something that uh, you build it once, and then you can just keep running it any number of times. Uh, and then if you want to make any changes to that infrastructure, the way out is you go back to the step one. You recreate the image from scratch. That's build that image right from the scratch. And then you, have, you create it again. Well, a Docker has a little advantages. It's not as it was earlier. But so Docker has that layered images. So you don't have to go really back. But if you have, in case of Docker, as I mentioned, Docker images are like layered file systems. So if you have an, a base Ubuntu image, you do an installation, say you set up probably JDK on that, your JVM on that. And then if you want to make some other change, and then you want to go and update the JVM, you're going to start right from middle. You, you just can't go in between and just change. I, oh, I just want to go and change the JVM in between. It's no, you will have to go right from the beginning and start. So that's how, that's one of the drawbacks of Docker. So basically, Docker and Chef both provide a lot of good features. So Docker comes with its own package of awesomeness. And Chef has a lot of umbrella of solutions. So both together, we can create something awesome. This is, again, our slide to emphasize that both can work together. So Chef actually came up where, it's, where a lot of your manual tasks were replaced with, uh, 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 with a robot, with Chef. And then it was based on uh, three core principles. That's idempotence. And then the pull model, where the client remains thin. The order in which your configuration is defined. And yeah, we've got a huge community support. So if you run into any issues working with Docker, you've got a big community to just fall back. I'm sure most of you all must be on the mailing list, and it's really active, and it's, it's awesome. Whereas Docker, you can say it's a different kind of a robot doing your work in a different way. It's, it's fast. It's easy. And yeah, you can actually bake it to build a good solution using Chef. Okay, uh, we'll just go and check how you could build a simple CD pipeline using Docker. Uh, it uses Knife SSH. So if you look at it, it's a simple CD pipeline where you have code in your GitHub. You push some changes. Uh, there are some most of the advanced build tools like Maven or uh, Gradle or most of the build tools have inbuilt Docker plugin support. So you can actually while you can use them. So when you run your uh, build tools, you can, it, it would generate a Docker image for you, which has your application inside that image. And then uh, you can push that image to your Docker registry. Uh, you can uh, add uh, different tags, or you can actually, so you can, yeah. And then you can deploy. And you can deploy using knife SSH. You can use push jobs. So I'll, talking about, I'll be talking about both of them. And there can be obviously different ways out. So that square that is marked is actually shows you can do all of that in the, inside the CI server. So that's how it's marked. And the simple pipeline would look it's just as simple as that. You've got your GitHub repo. So this SBT Docker, that command that you see, it's SBT is the Scala build tool. As I mentioned, our product is written in Scala. So we, I'd say, had used the Scala build tool We eventually shifted to Maven for whatever different reasons. But even Maven has a Docker Maven plugin. So you can actually run something like MVN uh, Docker build. And it would generate a Docker image for you. And you can push it into your Docker registry. And run the knife SSH command. And you'll say, OK, these are the set of nodes. And just go and uh, uh, run that deploy.sh on it. So this deploy.sh in our case is actually just three commands. Docker pull the latest Docker image from the registry, stop Docker stop the running container, and uh, Docker run the latest whatever I've fetched, just run it. So you, your node gets updated, or the, it, the container, the node on which you want to run the Docker, it just gets updated itself. With the, so 
So this is how it would just look like. It's just an example of a Hello World program, which keeps printing Hello World every five seconds. So that's it like SBT Docker, if you see, it, it actually generates, it, it, uh, generates uh, an image for you. So if you do Docker images, it's listed, and you just do Docker run. So I just mentioned, I'll just take a note to mention about Docker registry. So Docker registry is a place where you can actually store your um, Docker images. Docker also has an automated repository management. So there is something you can, your Docker registry, you can hook it up with GitHub. So if somebody does a push to a, say, some branch in your uh, GitHub, uh, it would, an automated uh, Docker build would be triggered in your Docker registry. This is this automated build right now is a little clumsy and not flexible. So it takes about 20 minutes or more to build a very simple Docker image, which is like it's, it's sometimes it takes even 30 minutes. So it's it's not stable, and there's a lot of inflexibility. Like as we'll go forward, like uh, it's not just the application that you'd like, want to include. There'll be some kind of configuration that you would want to make in your application. So or sending certain credentials to your uh, Docker container, so all of that if, is not, it's, it's not as flexible. So doc, automated builds is not flexible, but if that works well, it's actually going to do half of your job. If it will make your life even more simpler. So now, why am I talking about push jobs in a Docker session? So it's like, uh, uh, okay, so Chef, um, initially was based on a pull model, or it, it is actually based on a pull model. So it believes that the server, chef server, is a, it should be thin. And the chef client actually pulls for updates about what I need to update myself with. So it says, okay, when you run chef client, it's the node status gets updated with whatever changes it has to. Now with uh, growing, there was a growing, there is a growing need of when, like for example, if somebody makes a changes to your GitHub, you don't want to wait for that X interval. Like 20, after 20 minutes, your chef client would run. So we don't want to wait for that much time. If we want to actually push, push your changes immediately into, uh, say, your dev environment or some environment, you want to push it. So you want to go in for a push model. While we were evaluating Docker, uh, there was also something said like, OK, you can use just Docker and Ansible, and it will make your life very simple. I am a very big chef fan, and I felt, OK, I tried a chef and Ansible, but then as the complexity started increasing, it, I felt that Chef has a lot of more features which you can actually use instead of uh, just making it simple. And at that time, there was something called, they were saying, oh, Chef started, so there was this mention of push jobs. So Chef saying, oh, you want push functionality? There, we have push jobs. So that's why we just explored push jobs. So now we already saw a pipeline which used Knife SSH. So in, this, in that example, Knife SSH worked like a push, so, but I'm saying almost. So almost because this push was done by uh, the CI server and not by the chef server. So when you pushed a change, it was pushed by someone else. So it's not the chef server who's saying, okay, go, and these are your changes. So your chef uh, is, had a pull model, and now it's introduced a push jobs. So it's actually felt that the world is going around. So you actually, something that you Chef had some uh, uh, reasons to have this pull model, but then we're going back and having giving a functionality which is try, with which you can push changes. So push jobs are defined like this. Uh, Chef push jobs in an extension of Chef server that allows jobs to be run against nodes independently of the Chef client run. So it actually is self-explanatory. You don't have to wait for a Chef client to get the changes. So in our, this particular context, the commands that we want to run are just these three. Docker pull latest image, or a particular tag image, stop uh, the existing container, and run the latest image, latest container that I have taken. So how are push jobs different from knife SSH? So we already have knife SSH. How are push jobs different? So push jobs use the message bus. I think, I guess it's zero MQ. Um, it actually claims to attack the scalability issue. So because the parallel SSH, the SSH protocol is slow. At, so if you have hundreds and thousands of nodes, 
uh, knife assistance can get slow. Uh, the third point is actually the biggest advantage of push job. So when you are using knife SSH, you don't have you, you don't get the feedback on deployment. It's not as easy. So you can always go and make it work. So as we always know how to make things work, so we can make it work. But it's not easy. Whereas with push jobs, this deployment status is relayed back, and push jobs are actually have it's a newborn baby. So it's like there is a lot of work to be done on push jobs. It's actually a little complex at the moment, and since knife SSA has been long in the for a long time, it's actually easy to use right now. So for that, uh, to push jobs, to uh, this is how you'd actually set up your push job server. It's supported in Chef Server 12, and uh, you can run it as a standalone or a high availability. You just have to run those three commands, and you set up your push, uh, set up your Chef server to be uh, push jobs compliant, I mean, push, to have that push jobs functionality. So you need to set up your workstation. Uh, you need the push jobs plugin. You need to get your uh, knife cookbook. And you need to, uh, from, uh, yeah, you need to get the push jobs cookbook. And there are a few attributes you need to set. There is an example here. You just have to set those two attributes. And then you just upload your push jobs cookbook to your chef server. Then you create two groups, pushy jobs writers and readers. You add a user to that group. And then you run your uh, the pseudo chef client. You run it on your node. And then from your workstation, you can check the node status by running the knife node status command. So you'll know that, OK, you'll, get, you'll see something like an available, which means that, yes, the node, can, you can run push jobs on your uh, node. So there was quite some setup that we had to do to make a node actually push jobs, uh, so to be able to run push jobs. During this, we faced a couple of issues, but then if you do it rightly, properly, it's, it actually works later. So this is an example here. To st actually run, start that job, you run the command knife job start and docker sh. So docker sh is something, it, our script would look like a docker pull, stop the existing container, and run. But when we like tried to look at uh, whether push jobs really help us, but we found it a little complex. And again, I'd like to mention that since we are building a solution for a product which is not yet live, it's, it's, it's still under development, our aim is actually not to make things complex. We want to make it simple. We, we've got a good chance to do that. And we don't want to make anything complex. And since it's like uh, in a couple of months, we might, we'll go, be going to, into production. And as the product starts, you know, uh, as the time grows in production, a lot of complexity starts coming up, propping up in ops. And then we want to start very simple and uh, easy. So we, we found that push jobs had a little bit complexity. They didn't run at one time. But I'm sure there's a lot of work to do. In fact, just before the conference, I think Mark from uh, Chef, he came and said, OK, I guess you're, you're all, uh, using push jobs. You're trying push jobs. So if there's something, we'll make that a priority and you know just have that uh, development done. So it's, it's actually, as you see, chef development is uh, driven by the market demand. So yeah. So right now, push jobs doesn't seem that the right choice, but I'm sure it'll work good. So what we saw was a simple case of how you can use Docker, but gradually things start getting complex. So if you look at a Docker image, it comprises of the application as well as the configuration. Now, what's the configuration? So configuration is anything other than the application. It can be your credentials, your packages, software, sports, files, database. There's some certain custom setups you might have to do. So in our case, we wanted to actually, uh, whenever we started a one case, when we started a Docker container, we wanted to mount the contents of an S3 into that container. And for some reason, we didn't want to mount that volume on the node. We wanted to mount it inside the Docker. So, so there is something that you need to do other than just running your application. So you just do, it's not just an application inside your Docker image. We had to write lots of code to get that uh, S3 mounted just before the container, the application inside the container started. Or uh, one example, common example would be that uh, uh, the container would run in actually three different environments, and every environment has different configuration. So which configuration needs to be inside the 
a docker so do we go some so there were certain decisions to be taken like do we embed uh, three different configurations inside the docker container and when the docker container starts you tell him okay you're running on the dev so then inside it'll go it'll say oh i'm on the dev then i have to pick up the dev dot configuration so i have to pick up all the dev configuration then it says okay this is it tells the uh, application oh this is the uh, environment you're running or should it be like uh, do we create three different images for three different uh, environments so if you have a docker running on uh, your dev and if you think it is good to be enough to be promoted to pre prod so you take the analogous uh, docker image from your different pre prod uh, image so these were some of the complexities it started getting complex it became difficult to manage this entire configuration or setup business there was another issue with the uh, docker is that the secure uh, credential management it's actually not really uh, 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 what do you say it's it's not really secure so uh, the credentials inside the docker are ideally hard coded so if you have a docker image you cannot pass credentials to it you'll have to pass them as environment variables or you'll have to in, uh, hard code those um, credentials inside your container inside your image so which doesn't seem like so now you might call it a work around or it, uh, we just happened to make it a good fix so this is how we did so the uh, the change here was we created a base image and that base image had things that we actually want so for example i mentioned about having mounting the s3 into our uh, image so we had a docker uh, a docker file written and then that docker file actually grew hundreds of lines so it was like we started wondering what different are we doing than writing huge shell scripts we are just converting instead of those huge bash scripts we are writing huge docker files and for different types of uh services that we want to run we had different types of doc huge files written docker files and then we called them as our base images and when we had to build them we used our scala build tool and then it made use of that a custom image that we wrote and then we deployed using knife ssh so till now things were good but uh, when since we are working on a development project the way we the we thought okay fine we are now good to go that configuration had to be changed a lot of architecture was changed and then we constantly had to keep changing those docker files the base image had to be changed consistently constantly and then we started a lot of issues started coming in like we were not fast enough to do so we were keeping on so we ended up doing the same job again and again and it didn't seem like a good idea so that's where docker so we went to do docker using a docker cookbook so it actually helps you manage the docker images and deployment so there's a docker cookbook available in the supermarket you can install you can build docker images you can pull and run containers and then you can push images into your registry and it has actually those three uh, important lwrps it's the docker container docker image <laughs> docker registry and it, a good explanation is available in the readme also uh since we are if we started using a uh, chef for this docker management we also can use encrypted data backs to send credentials so you don't have to hard code or send environment variable so you can do it as simple as this here we've just sent so this docker registry can be private it can be public so of course ours is private so we had to say, so we can send credentials is like this uh this is the way we can use the docker underscore image so we can build a docker image using this so we can build um then push to the docker registry you can delete the image from the machine using this action remove so action push action build you can run the docker container uh, with this you can run and then there are a lot of so the way uh, docker uh, use uh, the parameters that you need to pass to docker you can actually uh, have so all of this is supported in the docker cookbook so you can open up certain ports you can send environment so you are you can send that okay you are running on pre prod right now so it, it can go back and uh, that container would know on which environment it's running there's something more you can do is you can actually generate your docker file so you can have a template written and then you can give certain um, parameter so you have a docker file template and then you can build the docker file 
using templates. So, gradually from that basic workflow we had migrated, so we had some decent workflow here where we built the application, we saved the artifact into a repository manager. So, now we could actually store lots of artifacts and these artifacts were not uh, bound, so, so we here we dis, uh, differentiated between that artifact and the image. So, we saved all the artifacts, we didn't actually, so when we used the build tool, uh, to generate it, we could not, there was no way of getting that artifact outside that Docker image. So we had to save every Docker image, instead of that we got it outside. So now we have the artifact, then we could build the Docker image using the Docker cookbook. Then the Docker cookbook, uh, you can deploy using the Docker cookbook itself. So we had a more mature workflow. This worked very well for us. Uh, one problem we faced was now the next, so using, this is actually a very good pipeline to begin with, but the problem, the only problem remaining was to debug what's happening inside the Docker container. So that was the challenge here. So that time we had a sneak peek into the chef containers. So what are chef containers? So chef containers are a package, but package that provides configuration management for containers. It has actually three components. Uh, chef container, so chef client, it's the latest chef client which is able to run on a container. Run it, it's actually a, a, a process that helps manage the child processes. Uh, it's used extensively in chef and it's also used in the chef container. Uh, it's used in the chef server also, also, apart from the chef containers. It's actually a lightweight cross-platform in its scheme to ensure that all the child processes are managed properly. And sorry, uh, Chef in it is uh, custom written by Chef, and it actually delegates the uh, r management of Docker, con uh, the ma management of child processes to the run it. So Chef in it is actually there is something called it runs as the PID one of the container. So when you start up, uh, Chef in it is the P uh, PID one. So by Chef containers, so you can bootstrap your bootstrap your container which uh, chef client without an SSH connection. So you don't have to have, the container need not have SSH connection. You can manage multiple services inside your container. Well, uh, for Docker, they say that initially they said that, okay, you should have only one, I mean, the, one of the, as we saw, advantages of, or uses of Docker was running microservices. Uh, so, but in our case, we had to run multiple services inside the container. So it actually, using chef containers, that's possible, and it's actually a good idea to have it. You can uh, manage the running state of your container. And there is consistency across architectures and mixed architecture applications. With this, I mean that you might have an architecture where you are, uh, uh, where you are working with physical, virtual machines. You are uh, have running stuff on the cloud. You might want to run now on uh, Docker. You might have a test environment which is in which is using Docker, but you're actually running on a physical machine in production. So if you have chef containers, uh, it's, it's actually, so you might use chef containers for running containers on your test environment, but in production, you can use the same set of cookbooks and same chef. Uh, so you just have to have the chef run list and you can run it on this chef container or on a physical machine. It's actually, we felt that it's actually best suited for you. So if you have already applications, traditional app, applications which are running, uh, then you can actually transition them into containers. So it's actually chef containers is a good app, uh, a choice here. So handling last mile configuration when container boots, so there are some things that you probably need. So when a container boots, you probably need to have certain um, uh, uh, things, like probably you want to have a monitoring agent on your machine. So this can be done. Uh, so handling last mile configuration becomes easy with uh, uh, chef containers. And yeah, so getting the best of two worlds is like, I, we believe that this is the best solution to have Docker as well as Chef running together. So this actually uh, suits suit the best. Uh, this, these are the examples of how you can use a Chef container. So you need to have the, uh, install the knife container gem. Um, then you run the knife container Docker in it. And then there are a couple of parameters. Uh, you can just set them. So this is an example of uh, running the knife container, and then if you see the last line that's highlighted in red, it's actually created the Docker context for you. So it contains, if you open that and if you see, it would have the Docker file. 
then the knife container build command would build your Docker image. So it resolves the Docker dependencies, it builds your Docker image, it cleans up chef artifacts. So again, example, if you look at it, if you note the step number two, uh, it has, it actually bootstraps your uh, container, it's just chef, chef client, uh, chef init dash dash bootstrap, it's actually installing your uh, chef client in it. And then if uh, uh, just those two commands and you have the Docker image ready with a chef client in it, and you just do a Docker push and then a Docker run and it would run for you. So we are actually, uh, we believe that uh, our product under development, uh, we've started DevOps at the right time. We've got a super cool DevOps culture. As, uh, in the morning, as you mentioned, we've got an empowered team. We are uh, encouraged to try out stuff, find out the right or the best approach to do stuff for, uh, you know, whatever is needed for DevOps. We've got a lot of support. We've, so uh, we've got, uh, so our development team, and the uh, DevOps team, we've got a lot of interaction. Everybody's involved in everything. It's not like I'm doing development, you're doing ops work. It's, it's everybody works together. It's, it works really well for us. And we've also started DevOps at the right time. So how do you think our DevOps experience would have been? Any guesses? It was that simple. <laughs> so uh, we believe that probably uh, no matter when you start DevOps or how you do whatever decisions you make, things actually, uh, one mistake we did, is, did was we directly started using Docker. So uh, when we started deploying, so though we have mock development environment, we started deploying stuff to it, it was running as containers. And gradually as the project uh, started expanding, we, we uh, had a time where we couldn't debug stuff. We couldn't go and look inside what's happening inside the Docker containers. So we had to take one step back. And then uh, we actually decided, so right now we decided to stop using containers for a while and do traditional deployment. And there are several lessons that we learned. So running applications in containers is easy. But debugging applications inside containers is difficult. So there's a lot of work that happens is actually this point. Deb do stuff so that you can know what is happening inside. So you can very well run multiple services inside a Docker container. We tried running it and it actually works very well. There's no issue. It's not like have only one service inside a container. Docker networking was like an issue. So you have lots of the containers running on different nodes on the same node and then they are talking to each other. They are sharing the host, the space and it, it's actually a little tough point. Sequential progression, which again aligned a lot with uh, something that we learned today morning in the keynote is about, uh, you know, uh, progress with iteration. So you actually iterate your work. So that's where uh, we, we, as I mentioned, we directly start jumped into Docker and then we went back. We want to ensure that stuff works. And our next plan is, yes, we are going to containerize everything. At the moment, we took a step back and we decided we have to start from step one and not directly jump. So we cannot get uh, stuff right at the first go. Or something that we know. And yeah, happy baking, happy docker, happy chef. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. Any questions? So we have two microphones uh, for questions. And then if you have one, please wait until we can get a microphone to you so we can record the question. Yay. I guess I should give you the microphone. Um, with Docker, is there any way we can escape from writing bash script? Like I've been using Chef for a year, and I for uh, I don't like I don't want to mess with the bash script. Try anymore. using Chef containers. <laughs> so actually, uh, not exactly bash scripts, but with Docker, when there is a Docker file, there are a lot of bash scripts that are written. But uh, a little bit of that work, I mean, writing of those scripts is safe if you uh, start using Chef containers. Actually, so Chef containers is like a Docker, but Chef inside Docker, so it's like a layer. It helps. It's it's one step better than Docker. It uses Docker, yeah. oh, okay. so you can use cool. you can try Chef containers actually. Okay, thanks. Right here. So you outlined, um, I think, very well some of the challenges with using Docker in what it looks like a production environment. Did you consider using restricting its use just to CI testing? Uh, yes, actually, uh, as you know, I probably, so that's actually a good point. We did, uh, so our test environment is actually pretty complex. We are dealing with huge data and we want to actually test it on 
huge data. So we uh, want to actually replicate everything. So the three environments that we mentioned, in our case, they're actually going to be identical. So instead of uh, doing just CI testing on Docker, we, uh, our plan is to have exact same environment on all three. So in fact, we would have production data coming into all three environments. So this is our actual goal. So for us, it didn't actually, um, uh, didn't, it wasn't an option, but I'm sure for CI testing, lots of, um, there are a lot of examples where people are using Docker only for testing. Thank you. So while running multiple containers on one single host, mm -hmm. uh, how you are uh, planning to see the system resource utilization per container for capacity management? Yeah, so uh, that was one of the challenges we faced. That was a good uh, point, actually. So that was one of the challenges we faced. And so we started, uh, actually, we, in fact, ran a monitoring agent inside a, uh, uh, the Docker. So we actually, and then that agent was checking the process that is running inside that Docker. And it was giving us, so, so yeah, system information. We, we were getting the application information that's running. So we got that information inside the Docker running, so, yeah. Good uh, presentation, uh, Mukta. Uh, one quick question. What is the build or the CI server that you used in your pipeline or uh, the workflow? Uh, can you repeat, please? Uh, CI server or the build engine, what is that you used in your workflow? Yeah, so we started with Travis CI. Uh, but later we use uh, we are using Jenkins now. So in fact, uh, if you note uh, that you cannot run a Docker inside a Docker. So Travis CI uses Docker. So if you want to run that SBT Docker or you want to run a build tool inside CI which generates a Docker image, you can't do it inside a Travis CI. Hello, thanks, Hi. Mukta. Um, a question, uh, you, when you deliver changes to the application uh, after it's already deployed in production, um, are most of those changes coming through a new Docker image or are they, um, only, are they only coming through Chef or is it kind of a combination of both? Yeah, it's actually uh, those changes, uh, as I mentioned, we sp uh, like, uh, conceptually split them into changes to the application versus changes to the configuration. Uh, since right now we are not completely live, we are, both our changes are happening pretty fast. So we have a lot of configuration changes as well as a lot of, uh, um, uh, of application changes are of, of course. So code is getting changed as well as the configuration. Both is getting changed. So the way out right now is, this was in fact an excellent question where, uh, a challenge where we faced with Docker since we are rapidly having so many changes we decided right now so we, right now, since we are not using Docker, this is the approach we are using, actually. Um, so the configuration that is being generated, we are generating it through Chef. So you can have different uh, files for, say, for uh, development. Uh, you have, a, say, consider there is one file for called development.configuration we are generating. And then we take that file, you take the application, and then you build a Docker image. So that's how we plan to do it, probably. But that is something where we didn't reach well with Docker. Do we have one last question for Mukta? So could you please elaborate on the Travis CI issue that you faced? And you, is that why you had to move to Jenkins? Yes. So, um, okay. So, we, uh, in, in the English, like, so, okay. So, Travis uh, CI brings up Docker containers, which run your builds. So if I'm using my build tool, say for example, if I'm using Maven, and if I say Maven build Docker image, it's making use of uh, Docker to build that image. So if you, ha if you actually happen to start a Docker container and try running Docker PS, it will not run. You cannot have Docker inside a Docker. So if you have your build environment, which is actually a Docker container, so you cannot uh, say that create a Docker image for me inside a Docker container. So that was an issue. 
that was not the only reason we moved to Jenkins though. Yeah. So are you clear or should I elaborate a little more? Thanks. Thanks. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you.